It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. It is an axiom of American ideals that with hard work and self-sacrifice, any person born on the bottom rung of this country's socioeconomic ladder can climb their way to prosperity. As President Obama and a thousand others have said, if we give it our all and play by the rules, anyone can succeed. That's the American dream, and we're taught at school and church and through television, books, and movies that this is the great difference between our society and the stodgy class-based ones in England and the rest of Europe that we violently broke away from back in 1776. That American dream is predicated on the idea that we all are given an equal opportunity to succeed. Of course, until very recently, that wasn't even remotely true. African Americans were enslaved and then segregated. Jews were ostracized, women were oppressed, all minorities were denied education and work opportunities. Native Americans were enslaved, robbed, segregated, and driven from their land and possessions by the U.S. Army. All the while, the government provided vast benefits for white Americans, especially for men giving them millions of acres of land stolen from others, building them schools and universities, like the one we're broadcasting from today, openly providing loans, tax breaks, health care, and preferential treatment in every aspect of our society, right up until, well, very recently. Only over the last 50 years did that meaningfully change, as movements for civil rights and women's equality challenged our government's supreme commitment to affirmative action for white men. That change unleashed tremendous levels of new educational and economic achievement by, in particular, millions of African Americans and women of all races. Yet as opportunity finally became more genuinely available in America, a new challenge to the American dream has emerged, massive income inequality. The Occupy Wall Street protests in 2011 introduced our national discourse to a now iconic disparity, the top 1% of the population's hoarding of wealth and opportunity from the other 99% of Americans. The Occupy Wall Street protests in 2011 introduced into our national discourse a new and now iconic disparity, the top 1% of the population's hoarding of wealth and opportunity from the other 99% of Americans. The Occupy movement laid the blame for the country's decreasing economic mobility squarely at the feet of the most elite of America's elites. Then in 2015, Donald Trump, the king of the elite wealthy 1%, baffled political observers when he began reaching across class lines to declare the American dream dead for the forgotten men and women of our country, shuttered right alongside their factories, mines, and stores on Main Street. He fueled a wave of populist passions against Washington elites and rode it all the way to the Oval Office. But is the top 1% really where the focus should be? Or is the real problem in the top 20%? Upper middle class families with incomes above $100,000, like mine and millions of you PBS viewers all across the country. That's the argument of our guest this week. Richard Reeves is a senior fellow of economic studies as well as co-director of the Center on Children and Families at the Brookings Institution. His new book is titled Dream Hoarders, How the American Upper Middle Class is Leaving Everyone Else in the Dust, Why That is a Problem, and What to Do About It. It argues that our country's often well-meaning top fifth of earners actually perpetuate inequality and stop others from climbing the ladder of American success. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So let's get at your, uh, your primary argument. What's, we've heard so much about income inequality and this new axiom that income inequality is bad. But, but the, the distinction that you're trying to make uh, is that we focus too much on this very elite, the very richest, those who've amassed this very high percentage of all of the wealth of America and all of the, the earnings of America in any given year. But, so, but what's the difference between this upper middle class group that you're talking more about and, and the income inequality argument as we've been hearing it? Well, I think the, 
the main difference is economic. It's simply that you know, obviously one percent to get into the top one percent, you have to be that much richer. So in terms of income, that puts you in the four hundred thousand a year plus bracket, roughly now. The top 20%, I think now, is actually closer to if you're above about 125,000 a year household income. So a clearly much bigger group. My view, looking at the trends in income inequality, is that the we are the 99% analysis is both wrong and unhelpful. It's empirically wrong because there's growing inequality below that level. You're seeing a kind of breaking away, you're seeing people pulling away well below the top 1%. And I think it's unhelpful because it has allowed too many people to imagine that the inequality problem is always about people who are richer than themselves. So when people talk about inequality, it's always those, rich, those people up there, the rich, who are the problem. And sometimes I think it may be closer to home and we may need to look in the mirror and consider that we may be part of the problem. It's not just those rich people at the top. We always like to imagine that, that either the people above us or below us are the real problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. We're always either pointing down at the poor and wondering, you know, what do we do to help the poor or what's wrong with them, or up at the rich, so we blame Wall Street. So at the May Day Occupy Wall Street march, one in three of those marching had earnings of more than 100,000, not just household income, but earnings. That puts them in the top 10% of income earners, marching against the rich. And so you do see this kind of class warfare taking place within the top 20% or the top 10%. I mean, the envy seems to be greatest of those who are almost at the top for those who are right at the top. And I think that's unhelpful to our politics. And I think what you're seeing in the, in the way that it's coming through the political framework, including in the presidential election, is that actually a lot of what's happening was about class as well as race. It's obvious that race played a very big part. But there's also this sense of actually a lot of people who were drawn towards Trump weren't anti-rich. They were anti professionals, anti-elites, anti-experts, anti those sorts of people that kind of tell them what they're doing wrong and run all the institutions, assume that they're going to get a good four-year college degree, have a good uh, big house, etc. And so I think it was more interesting. I think Trump was able to sort of tap into some class discontent in a way that was channeled towards not the top 1% or 0.1%, not the billionaires or the millionaires, but the professionals, mm -hmm. that, that white collar group that we, I call the upper middle class. But so one thing I think that is consistent across all the various analysis of income inequality is that below the groups you're talking about, below the upper middle class and, the, and that top 1%, the elite, the possibility of people leaving that and moving up the economic ladder yeah. seems to have at least been stymied or become more, more likely yeah. to, be, to be stuck there than, than people at least once believed to be the yeah. case. That's right. That, that's right. Yeah. And certainly by comparison to other countries. And so as you, as you be began the program, the idea of the American dream is very strong rhetorically, but not empirically. And so if you actually look at the chances of being upwardly mobile, they're lower in the US than in many other countries. And that's partly because of the uh, structural racism that you referred to, and that black Americans in particular are more likely to be stuck. But it's also just because this kind of bottom 80% broadly haven't seen much income growth in the last few decades. They're moving less geographically. There's less, much less wage movement because to the extent that women's wages have gone up, men's wages have gone down, essentially canceling each other out. And so the bottom 80% of the US income distribution looks quite similar today to how it looked 40 years ago. Meanwhile, the top 20% of earners and householding are pulling away. And sure, the closer you get to the top, the more you see that pulling away. But if you want to see where the gap is opening up, and I don't think it's just an economic gap, I think it's a class gap. And I say that as someone who comes from a class-bound society, a class gap that is opening up at around that 80, 80th percentile, that kind of top fifth is where we should be thinking. In a class-structured society that has very well-defined classes, there is this assumption that you're born into a spot in it, and you're not going to, and, and you shouldn't expect to move in the traditional sense that you're not going to move from one to the other. Uh, but it is by nature of the birth to begin with. Uh, what we're looking at in the U.S. is this emergence of a of a class. But then when you say hoarders, the dream hoarders, you know, hoarders suggests a, you know, an active intention. You know, it was a decision to, to, we've got it, we've made it into this space. Maybe we weren't born into it, but we've made it into this class. And now we're hoarding it specifically to exclude others from coming into us. There's a kind of intentionality to the suggestion. But what, what do you mean by that? What are you talking about? The class consciousness is very different here to, to the UK where I come from. The UK is a very class conscious society. And it, that's a very bad thing in many ways. But the good thing about it is it makes people aware of class divisions and aware of structural class divides. The US is very sensitive for obvious and good reasons to structural racial divides. Those overlap with structural class divides that Americans don't see as clearly because of this sense that it's a classless society, meritocracy, Horatio Alger. 
There are actually a lot of people in the US who are born on third base thinking they'd hear the triple because of this sense of meritocracy, right? Well, I got here because of my own hard work and kind of brilliance. There's no sense of guilt. At least posh people in the UK feel guilty some of the time. <laughs> and the reason why that's, that, that guilt matters, uh, not to argue, is that it, it's, it t signals something about I'm aware that some of my success is due to factors that are not simply my own responsibility. What happens is the hoarding comes be precisely because those at the top are able to convince themselves they're there as a virtue of their own merit, their own brilliance and diligence. They can then start to rig the tax code so that they get disproportionate benefits from tax expenditures. They can start to rig the housing market so that they can protect the value of their houses. They can start to dominate the institutions of higher education, like the one we're in now, so that their children get to enjoy a good quality four-year college. They are able to shift the market in a way that ensures their success and most importantly ensures the success of their children in a way that can only be described as class perpetuation but they do so under the illusion of classlessness. So the camouflage of classlessness and meritocracy is now very damaging to the idea of the American dream where we start where we started. So how do we separate out, as we try to figure out what the, real, the problem really is, how do we separate out the, the kind of selfishness of kicking the ladder away for the people who haven't made the climb up yet? How do we, how do we acknowledge that there's a dimension of that, but at the, at the same time also acknowledge that when you're trying to change a society from one that is predominantly very poor people engaged in subsistence farming, when you're trying to modernize that, well, moving people up the ladder is actually an easier thing. You know, particularly when the, direction, when the wind's blowing in the right direction, you can change things really fast. Put in good roads, put in bridges, you know, basic infrastructure results in huge changes across the whole society. But as things get more and more complicated, right. it actually it gets harder and harder to move people up the ladder. And so on the one hand, like one of the things you point out is that entry into the upper middle class today may well require two degrees. You know, a bachelor's degree and a graduate degree used to be that one degree was kind of the ticket into into that that kind of affluence. Now, is that an example of? of kicking the, the ladder away, or is that just an example of that's just the evolution of society and you just need to have more credentials, more knowledge, more expertise. That's how we sort out the really, really high achievers from the not so high achievers. Well, actually, sometimes I think it's maybe not two degrees, but four degrees, because of course, with the increase in the number of women, uh, there are now more women graduating from four-year colleges than men. And what you're seeing is that those who have a college degree are very likely to marry somebody else with a college degree. And actually, if they've got a postgraduate degree, to marry someone who has a postgraduate degree. And their earnings are higher. And so what you're seeing is at a household level, this kind of educational uh, disparity and the earnings disparity is amplified at the household level. But I think, so what's the, what's the problem here? If you're getting well-educated, you're getting your kids to be well-educated, you are working hard at whatever your profession is, aren't you doing everything right? Isn't that what we want people to do? Yes. The question then becomes, at what point does the natural desire to do well for ourselves and our children conflict with or at least come into tension with other values, like equal opportunity, like others having a chance to rise as well? When do we actually start rigging the system as opposed to simply winning within it? And then I think when you look at things like the way that the housing market works in the US, even the way that admissions to four-year colleges works in the US, access to internships, those sorts of, those are kind of examples where actually we're rigging it in our favor. So at that point, the natural preference to do well has become something else. Yeah, uh, the, the idea that the rich are gonna get richer and in the gospels we're told that Jesus said, and the poor will always be with us. Uh, uh, and, the, and so in a way, the, this just sort of seems like the natural outcome of a modern society. But is that the case? And we're just, the natural progression of things is to a place that gets less and less uh, egalitarian? Uh, or has something gone wrong? Right. Well, that's the, so the fear is that it, this, this gets kind of baked in um, intergenerationally. So the, the sharp, one of the sharpest criticisms I've had from, from the right is you're basically pointing to people who are doing everything right getting educated, staying married, looking after the kids, and trying to make them feel bad about it. Mm. Right? That's basically that's a good, sharp criticism. Because, of course, there's a lot of truth to that, which is that actually the upper middle class are doing a lot of things. You've mentioned a lot of things they're doing well. But what that means is, you need to think about the next generation. It seems to me that the idea of the American dream is that there's a kind of restarting of the competition with each generation. And, of course, you're never going to create to use the overused metaphor of a level playing field with each generation for the reasons you've identified. There'll always be inequality in life chances. But surely our goal is to try and reduce the inequalities that come from the lottery of birth. I mean, who your parents are is entirely random. 
How you raise your children is not, of course. And so what does that mean? Do we say to the child who actually wasn't born into the upper middle class with well-educated affluent, affluent parents, but is born into a kind of struggling town, some of the places you've mentioned, do we say, well, that's just bad luck? When we said equal opportunity, we didn't mean it. And so what it means is that we have, to, we have to invest very heavily in the opportunities for those who are not as fortunate as those of us who are in the top 20%. Where's the money for that going to come from? From us. And so we need quite radical redistribution, not only of economic resources, but also of those opportunities so that each generation gets a chance to run a race again. It will never be an entirely fair race. But do we really want to end up with a society where we say, well, it's never going to be fair. My kids are always going to do better than yours. And by the way, there's almost no limit to what I can do to ensure that my kids are more successful than yours, even if it means my kids take a place that your kid might otherwise have got, because all's fair in love and war. And it seems as if this sense of entitlement that the American upper middle class have now means that they will engage in practices which would be unthinkable elsewhere and would have been unthinkable in other, other parts of US history, like legacy preferences in college admissions. Just well, take one example. But talk through those. So there, legacy preferences, you talk about internships. That's not something people typically point at as a nefarious area of American life. Uh, but, but rattle through some of those examples of rigging as you see them. Well, those are two good ones. I and mean, you're right, people, uh, it's, uh, as a European, it's shocking to me the internships, which are quite important, in many professions now, are just handed out on the, on, on the basis of who you know as a favor to somebody. And that's, I'm not making a partisan point here. Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York, gave internships to his two children in City Hall against the stated policy of his own administration. He had to get an ethics waiver to do it. What was surprising about that was that no one blinked. It would have finished his political career in the UK mm. to do that. Because the, the whole idea that internships, which are, if they're important, if they're valuable, then they shouldn't be allocated on the basis of who your parents are. That's a hereditary principle at work in the labor market. Any more than a job should be handed out on the basis of who your parents are. So that's one example. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to change the world, but it's a good illustration. Legacy preferences in college admissions, the fact that there's a hereditary principle at work as we're letting people into four-year public as well as private colleges, unthinkable in the United States of the 19th century, introduced in the 20th century for anti-Semitic reasons, and now a standard way for those who are at the top of the income ladder to help give their kids a better chance of getting into a high quality college and therefore do better a hereditary, but it has racist consequences of course, but it's also a classist, um, uh, it's a classist mechanism. And then I've mentioned this, but the, uh, the way that the local zoning laws work to restrict entry to the cities and areas that have the most economic opportunity is a growing problem. You mentioned, I think in the intro, there was lots of land for white men. Actually, there isn't that much land anymore in the places where the economic growth is. And land is getting very expensive in the places where there's economic growth. And one of the reasons it's so expensive is because it's so over-regulated. The US has a highly regulated housing market. And what that means is if you're on the right side of that, you've got an expensive house, thank you for the mortgage interest deduction, Uncle Sam, you can keep, you can keep out lower income people from your neighborhood, protect your local school, et cetera. And so you end up with a system that no one intended necessarily to be a class reproduction machine but it's a very effective one. The US class reproduction machine is more ruthlessly efficient than the one in the UK. And that's my uh, discovery, my disappointment as a new American, to discover that actually underneath this veneer, this Horatio Alger veneer, that actually your class system really is humming a bit more quietly than the one in the UK, but boy does it work well. And that's definitely logical on the, in the zero-sum game <laughs> equation, this idea, that, as you say, that uh, if there are a certain number of seats at the university uh, and you want more poor kids to take some of them, then there's some uh, want more black kids to be in some of those seats than some white kids are not going to get to be. That is the case. Yes. And the glass floor uh, the, um, uh, notion works, that there's a limited amount of space in that upper class, unless the glass floor is the floor of an elevator and the elevator is going up, mm -hmm. uh, and that the definition of these economic, of the quintiles is changing. It's just like that in the 1930s, to be in the bottom, the lowest quintile of American economics was to be hopelessly, yeah. desperately on the verge of starvation poor. Yeah. To be on the lowest, in the lowest quintile today is to be, to have a lot of difficulty, but the odds that you're actually on the verge of starvation, no matter what anybody says oh. about hunger in America, it, it's extremely unlikely. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in the Mississippi Delta, there were still people dying yeah. of hunger in the yeah. mid 1960s, uh, or freezing to death in the middle of the winter. You know, it was a fact. Yeah. That doesn't happen anymore. So if the elevator is going up, and that is the biggest counter-argument, I think, to, yeah. to your whole proposition, is that if the 
if the whole, if the pie is expanding, as some yeah. like to say, um, then in fact, these sorts of things are okay, are, yeah. are more okay. Well, I think we should just be clear that there are two things going on there. One is people getting better off over generations and over time. Uh, and is that good? Yes. Um, is, every, is anyone against that idea? No, basically. So actually to write, to write a book saying it would be better if people were better off and that fewer people died in the Mississippi Delta, it's not a provocative argument. Now, how you do it is a different matter. But there's something else, which is your relative position. Even if the, es if, if the escalator is going up quickly, that's better for everybody. And maybe the person in the middle isn't troubled about the fact that the people at the top seem to be the same every generation. Maybe they're not troubled about that because they themselves are doing better. But I'm troubled by it because I, I still think that if you want a society that prides itself on fairness and equal opportunity, and you looked and you saw the elite perpetuating itself across generations, then you'd start to worry about that. You'd start to worry that your elite wasn't actually drawing from the whole of society. You'd start to worry about the fact you weren't getting the best and the brightest. You'd start to worry that you were morphing into exactly the thing that I thought America tried not to be, which was a hereditary society. So you take my old country where we have a, a very, very hereditary head of state, a monarch. And so we know, there's no surprise, you don't get t-shirts in the UK, future queen or future king, <laughs> in the same way that you do in the US. In the US, people have that on the, and they're not kidding, right? Um, we know uh, accidents, um, unless they're, we know who's going to be on the throne. And you might say, we don't care about that as long as everyone else is getting better off. Okay. Um, if you end up with something similar, not obviously in the same scale, but if you end up with an elite that's perpetuating itself, if we know that our kids are going to remain on that top rung uh, every generation? Are we okay with that just so long as everybody else is getting better off too? And I think that's the central question here. Uh, there are different kinds of fairness, different kinds of mobility, and you, could have, you can want both. Um, but I don't think it's good enough for us just to say, look, so long as we help everybody else, we can continue to make sure we stay at the top and our kids stay at the top. I think there's a moral principle at stake here which requires some movement downwards as well as upwards. In terms, of, in terms of relative mobility, or you've got a hereditary society, and we should at least be honest about that. And ultimately, you offer up a prescription of sorts, where you talk about uh, initiatives that ought to happen to reduce unintended pregnancies through better contraception, and some of the sorts of things that already are, are, have had success with certain groups. Uh, you talk about uh, more home visits to, mm -hmm. you know, by educators to improve uh, parenting of kids, better teachers for kids in poor schools, yep. uh, funding college differently and fairly, dealing with exclusionary zoning that you were talking about, ending legacy admissions, mm -hmm. opening up internships. You know, you've got a, a number of these kinds of things, uh, all of which, if we added them together, would represent a, a, a pretty extraordinary uh, escalation of the intervention of government into, into these issues and lives, um, and are probably beyond the capacity of any individual member of that upper class mm -hmm. to, to uh, to make changes to. So uh, in the end, I mean, you're offering a st structural prescription, but really what you're saying is that there's a compelling moral argument for members of this upper middle class group to support some sort of a political agenda sure. that would bring the government very, very much more into the lives of, of that other 80% of the Americans. Yeah, so uh, the, the, I had to have a chapter on policy because I work for a policy think tank. But one reviewer said that this was a moral argument thinly disguised as a policy pamphlet. <laughs> that was the nicest thing anyone could have said about the book, because that's exactly what it is. You've listed policies that I think could change things quite significantly. But I think the problem is creating a culture, a political culture, within which those sorts of policies become thinkable, within which those sorts of policies are doable. That requires a change of uh, heart as well as mind. So Hofstadter wrote about the progressive era and the era running up to it, it was as much an affair of the conscience. That there was inward criticism, inward reflection. And I do think that something of that is required now. And it requires us to start from where we are, stand in our own shoes, think about our own lives, our own communities, our own neighborhoods, and build out from there a culture that will be more accommodating of the kinds of policies that we need to help the bottom 80%. It's not mysterious, the things we need to do to create more equal opportunities, to refinance higher education, to think about the allocation of teachers, to think about quality health care. These aren't, they're, then it's not a mystery what we need to do. The challenge is getting a political culture that will support those sorts of changes. And I've come to believe that one of the biggest obstacles to the creation of a political culture that will support that is the detachment and sense of entitlement 
and separation of the upper middle class. And unless the upper middle class themselves come to see themselves as part of the problem and therefore of the solution, then I think we're going to be stuck. And so if we're serious about inequality and we're looking for the face of it, we might want to start by looking in the mirror. Richard Reeves, thanks for being here. Thank you. What do you think about the hoarding of the American dream? What's your perspective? If you're a member of the upper middle class or part of the 80% struggling to climb the ladder, no matter which rung you're on, let's continue this discussion. Reach out to me using the email on your screen or on Twitter at Douglas Blackman. You can also follow our guest at Richard V. Reeves. As always, visit millercenter.org to keep updated on news and events, watch other episodes, and visit us on Facebook to catch live tapings of the show. See you next week. Thank you.